retire and maybe a Tauber, his wife. And uh, tell me, Mrs. Tauber, why is uh, Richard Tauber so remembered today? Is it because he put so much into films and records and radio, do you think, rather than sort of confining himself to the opera house? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think that Richard was a legend. He sang for all worlds. Uh, opera lovers, he pleased. Light operator, he pleased. I mean, he had this tremendous gift of loving music and wanting people to hear it. And I think that this is quite rare, because he didn't sort of sing for his wage packet. He sang because he loved music. Well, what was the story of his life, in fact? Well, very briefly, um, he was born in Linz in 1891, and uh, he was born, really, to the, to, to the sound of the dancing beat of the band in the orchestra, because his mother had him on the next door to the theatre. And he was brought up absolutely loving. He was about seven years old. He used to get all the pots and pans and saucepans and conduct his own orchestra. And then he was fortunate enough that his um, his father, he was illegitimate actually, but his father suddenly heard about him and um, adopted him and brought him up to be a very good musician and conductor. But he wanted to be a singer. And his father said, well, isn't it better to be a good conductor than a bad singer? He said, no, I'm going to be a good singer. I think he was. <laughs> yes, I noticed this, in fact. Um, he did, in fact, conduct later in his life, didn't he, as well? No, he conducted very early on in his life. He conducted his first orchestra, he conducted around 1913 or 1914. And um, then, of course, in the war, he conducted the London Philharmonic. He was a very fine conductor. When he was conducting Gary Ron at the Palace Theatre during the war, he used to sort of sing while he was conducting, you know. <laughs> I was wondering, um, the other singers, I mean, how did they take this um, emphasis on radio and um, films, of course? Richard or other singers? The other singers, how did they take this emphasis on it? I mean, did they think it was a good thing, or did they distract them a bit for it, perhaps? Well, I don't really think, I don't really think I can talk about other singers, can I? All I can talk about is how Richard just loved, you know, any media. What about these films, though? I mean, couldn't he have, um, couldn't he have sung music which was more satisfying to him, uh, in uh, the opera house than in the films? Or did he really get the same amount of kick out of singing? No. no. Richard loved, really his first love, and I think his last love, was opera. Mm. But then you must remember, he was the Viennese boy. He loved the little team and he did it, the Strausses, the Colmans, the Lehars. And this was a, this was a appeal to the childishness in him, and the, and, and the thing that I think made him terribly popular, because he, he loved people, and people loved him. But his real love, Opera. And German opera, particularly. German opera, particularly, yes. In fact, we've got him here singing um, a, uh, a, an aria from Madame Butterfly. This is, comes from uh, an Ember record, uh, Great Voices of the Century.
singing an aria from Madame Butterfly on uh, an ember disc called Great Voices of the Century. And uh, I realised that I'd be a bit remiss because um, uh, very early on I promised, in fact, to let you know the telephone number that you could ring up if you wanted to ring up, which is 499-5842. But um, tell me, um, Mrs. Tarver, in fact, what was Richard like as a person? was, I think, without question, one of the most generous uh, people that I have ever had the pleasure to know. He was completely honest. His misdemeanors or his infidelity, he was completely honest. Uh, he, he, he used to feel that um, being his wife, I should understand everything about him, and if I should forgive or condone. And, in a way, you did, because you loved him very much, and, and, and I don't think you could really treat a genius, and he was a musical genius, let's face it, uh, the same way as an ordinary human being. I really don't think you can, because they think differently. And um, they have to be inspired, and they can't go on being inspired by one woman. They could have, a, you know, a few other inspirations. Uh, I think his great affection that the public had for him was this tremendous... Um, love he had of singing. He used to bounce onto the stage in a concert platform and say, well, here I am. I'm here for you. Only for you. And I think this was his endearing quality because he was a very, um, terribly human person. And he wasn't a bit snobbish. Or he wasn't a bit high hat. He always comes across in his films as a man of some tremendous energy. Oh, his vitality was fantastic. I mean, he'd think nothing, you know, of them rehearsing all the morning. Uh, going to a cinema in the afternoon, which he was mad about, rehearsing in, again in between the shows, going back to a cinema early afternoon, and then sing a, a, a complete opera. He used to go to the cinema twice a day. Yes, twice a day he used to go to film. He was mad about film. I don't know. I think if he had been alive today, he'd have had at least six televisions all around every room in his house. You know? And uh, one always thinks of opera singers as leading an extremely sort of um, gay, uh, romantic kind of um, uh, very luxurious life. Was this the sort of life he led? Yes. Uh, I remember in, uh, in the coronation year, we had a house in London with butlers and this and that and that thing and chefs. And really and truly, he hardly was there because he used to like to go to the Savoy Grill, smile at everybody, see people. Every waiter was a schnappler to him. When he died, you know, the head porter at the Dorset Hotel, and I had no money because he left no money, said to me, don't you worry about the telegrams you've got for us, and he sent off 20 pounds worth of telegrams and paid for it himself.